This video has been sponsored by Blender Grid. Stick around to find out how you can get $20 worth of lightning fast renders absolutely free. Cycles is a very powerful render engine that comes built into Blender, producing spectacular levels of realism, but it can feel a bit slow at times, like all ray tracing render engines. To combat this, artists have come up with a wide range of techniques for speeding up the process, and today I'll be going over five great techniques I've picked up over a decade of working as a VFX artist. This isn't a video explaining how to speed up Cycles renders directly. Instead, we're going to discuss how to render more intelligently, and be more efficient in how you use ray tracing render engines, in some cases making the process hundreds of times faster than before. These are techniques that I've used while working on multi-million dollar blockbuster movies, where efficiency and quality is all important, and they can help you too. If you are a complete beginner to Cycles rendering, I would recommend you check out our Blender Beginners course, during which we go over the basics. The links to this and any other websites I mentioned can be found in the video description. Denoising is a huge boost to render speed, as you don't have to have your sample count nearly as high as you would otherwise. A common complaint about denoising is that when the render sample count is low, it often causes an unpleasant flickering effect in animated shots, like on the trees and floor of this little scene, and we also get a bit of a smearing effect on flatter textures, such as this concrete in the background of this example scene here. This often turns people off the idea of using denoising on their renders, opting instead for using outrageous sample counts to try and get a clean result. This happens when the denoise algorithm is only using the information in the noisy render to work out how to denoise the image, often leading to texture and shape being lost, and working it out from scratch on each frame, leading to the pattern jittering around throughout animated shots. You can see if it's operating under these conditions easily. In the compositor's denoise node, this will happen if you don't have the appropriate data to plug into these inputs here. Or in the render settings tab of the properties panel, if the render denoise has the passes option set to none. You might be able to negate some of this by making sure that the randomized seed is disabled in the sample section's advanced settings, because this will mean that the noise pattern doesn't change on every frame, but it's not likely to do much, especially if the camera is moving around. Not to worry, it is an easy thing to fix. For the compositor's denoise node, we just go into the view layers tab of the properties panel and enable denoise data. Connect the denoise albedo and the denoise normal outputs to the denoise node and re-render the image. All of that smeariness has now disappeared and we have a lovely clean result with all of the texture detail in place. Every time you render the scene from this point on, the denoise node will kick in and clean up the noise. Now it's also much better for animations as it's much more consistent between frames. This is still a low sample render, but the jittering has improved significantly. This is because it's deriving a lot of its information from the denoise data, allowing us to keep a lot of our texture detail and shape across multiple frames. We can get the same result with the denoise options in the render settings tab of the properties panel, by changing the passes option to albedo and normal. This essentially does the same thing that we did for the compositor before, except that it's all hidden away. I usually prefer to use the node, because then you can render out a noisy image sequence and only bother with the denoise process when you're doing the final compositing pass, saving you extra render time up front. You would need to export the denoise data as a separate image sequence, or embed it as an extra channel in a multi-layer EXR to have access to it later, so just bear that in mind if you decide to do it this way. That is a personal preference though, so you can use whatever denoise method you prefer. Or none at all, if you think that I'm out of my mind. <laughs> you also have the option of reducing the intensity of the denoise effect by mixing back some of the original noisy image, which can help to retain some detail. How many times have you finished a long render, only to find that there was some small problem making the image look worse than it should? Sure, we could go back into 3D, fix the problem, and re-render the scene all over again, but what if there was a way to quickly fix most of these problems in compositing with very little effort in a fraction of the time? Well, that's where a lot of these extra render passes come in, and none are more useful than light groups. Light groups are essentially renders of your scene with all of the lights separated into different passes, allowing us to change individual light intensities and colors. I cannot stress enough how useful this can be. Using these passes, with some quick and simple grading changes, we can completely overhaul the look of a scene. All of these examples you're seeing now were made from just one single frame render, all with the same lighting. It's also really easy to set up. First, we need to create the light groups. So let's go into the View Layers tab of the Properties panel, and under Passes, we have this Light Group section. To create a new light group, it's as simple as pressing this little plus button on the right, then changing the name of the light group by double-clicking the name and typing in whatever you like. You can make as many light groups as you like. In this case, I'll make three. Now we just assign the various light sources to their light groups. For HDRIs, we need to go to the world settings and under settings, we have this light group section. Just click inside this little text bar and then assign it to a group. And that's it. When we next render, the HDRI lighting will appear in that light group output. 
For other light objects, like directional, spot, and point lights, in the Object Settings tab of the Properties panel, under Shading, we have another light group section. Set the light group the same way that we did for the environment light, and ta-da! The light is assigned to the group. You can also save some time by assigning multiple lights at once, by selecting all of the lights in question, assign a light group to the active object, then right click the light group section text bar, and choose copy to selected. Now all of the lights you had selected at the time have been assigned to the group as well. Once we render the scene, we can go into the compositing section and use the light groups. We just combine them with mix nodes set to add, and now we can grade the scene lights individually. No need to re-render and waste hours of time just because the sun is a bit too bright or the torches are a bit too dim. It would be very strange to talk about speeding up the rendering process and not mention render farms. Render farms play a huge part in any film production studio for their ability to get renders done in a fraction of the time. And today's sponsor, Blender Grid, is no exception. If a thousand frame render would take you days to complete and you need it done fast, send it to a render farm and it could be done in less than an hour. Not only does it speed up the rendering process, but it allows you to continue working while the render is taking place because it isn't using your computer to do the work. All you need to do is upload your project to Blender Grid's website or use their Blender add-on and your scene will be rendered before you know it. You don't even need to have an account. You can just give your email and a link will be sent to you so that you can easily access all of your uploaded projects. And the price of the render will be calculated before you start so you know exactly how much it will cost ahead of time. As an example, this scene from my Master Environments course would have taken me most of the day to render, but on Blender Grid's farm it can be rendered in less than an hour. As an extra bonus, Blender Grid has kindly offered anyone using this link $20 of free credit so that you can try it out for yourself. Thank you Blender Grid for sponsoring the video and saving us all a ton of time in the process. What if I told you that sometimes you only need to render every second, third or even every tenth frame and still get the same result? Well in some cases, that is absolutely the case. Using interpolation tools, such as the free tool FlowFrames, you can take your renders and in a very short time produce extra frames between them. It works best in scenes with no camera movement or very slow camera movement, and you might only be able to use it on a background layer or something, but when you run into a good time to use it, only needing to render every other frame will reduce your render times to a fraction of what they would otherwise be. Normally I would render at 24 or 60 frames per second, but we can choose a lower rate and use flow frames to increase it later. I prefer to keep the frame rate in Blender at 24 or 60 and simply use the step option in the frame range section to skip over frames in the rendering process. If the step is set to 1, it will render every frame. If it's set to 2, it will skip every second frame. And on 3, it will render every third frame. And so on and so on. This allows me to keep the motion blur and animation speed consistent while I'm working on it, but still only render a fraction of the frames. A great example of where this workflow would save a huge amount of time is long panning shots of an environment like this one from my Master 3D Environments course. I rendered this shot at 6 frames per second, and it looks, oh, oh yuck, it's very jittery. Not to worry, I'll just open up flow frames, point it to the render folder, and set it to increase the frame range to 60 frames per second. I'll just hit interpolate, and after about a minute, we have our shot all smoothed out to 60 frames per second. If you were to couple this with AI upscaling tools, like Topaz Labs Video AI, and the AI Video Enhancer by VMake, you could render some things out at half the resolution and a fraction of the frame range, but end up with the exact same result. Now that is one heck of a speed increase. It is worth noting that pretty much all AI upscaling tools require payment, so bear that in mind when deciding whether or not to use them. In the same vein as light groups, we also have material passes, which provide a similar function to light groups, except these allow you to adjust the properties of materials after the render is complete. Is a bit of metal too shiny, or the wood texture you used a little bit too purple? Well, there's no need to fix it in 3D and re-render the whole scene if you rendered material passes. All we need to do is go into the View Layers tab of the Properties panel and enable the material passes we need for our scene. Diffuse and Glossy are always a good idea because just about everything requires those. Transmission is a good idea if you have glass, water, or anything else that's at least partially transparent. And if you have volumetrics in your scene, like fog or smoke, you'll want to enable them for volume as well. Once your scene is rendered, if we hop over to our compositor, we are greeted with a slightly terrifying view of all of these render outputs. But don't worry, it's not as bad as it looks. Each of the materials passes is split into three outputs, direct, indirect, and color. We use a mix node set to add to combine the direct and indirect because light is additive and those passes represent light intensity. And then we use another mix node to multiply the light intensity against the color. Do that for all of the material passes you exported and then add them together at the end. Now you can increase or decrease the reflectivity of materials, change the color of the reflections, 
change the base color of the material, make the object darker or brighter, whatever you like. This can save a lot of headaches. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to remove something from the reflection of an object or make a certain object a slightly different hue without messing with the color of the highlights so they blend better into the background. Without material passes, this kind of thing would be extremely difficult, and as a result, we can avoid time-intensive re-renders and get the work done much faster. The eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that while we're adjusting the material passes and light groups, we were actually adjusting those properties for all objects in the scene, not just a specific material or object. This is where masking comes in. While a simple mask might work okay for a single frame render, it's not ideal for an animated shot that could be hundreds of frames long. We could spend hours carefully masking out the object that we want to isolate, but chances are the result would not be perfect, and if we're spending hours masking, then we may as well have just re-rendered the whole thing anyway. This is where cryptomats come in. By activating them in the View Layers tab of the Properties panel, we can use the cryptomat node in the compositor to instantly and perfectly mask any object or material in the scene. To pick your target object or material, just look at the pick output of the cryptomat node, click the little plus button next to the mat ID text bar, and then simply click on the object or material that you want. You can add as many as you like and remove ones that you don't want anymore by clicking on the minus button and selecting them again. The masks will follow along with any animation and handle anything passing in front automatically, leaving you free to make any adjustments you like and have it limited to just the aspects of the image that you want to change. For example, I want the material changes I made before to be limited to just the black pieces in the chest scene. So I'll just select the black pieces using the mat picker and then use the matte input as a mask for the grading changes. There, now only the black pieces are being changed, much faster than masking it manually or changing the materials and re-rendering the whole thing. This is a huge time saver and something that I use every day. So these were my five favorite tricks for speeding up a cycle's workflow. I hope you find them useful as I know that they've saved me hundreds of hours over the years. When used together, techniques like this allow you to spend much less time waiting and more time creating. And don't forget to follow the link to Blender Grid to get $20 worth of free render credit. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe as it helps us out a lot, and be sure to share any cool tricks you might have for speeding up a cycles-based workflow in the comments below.